I'm Delaney. And I'm Hadley. And this is Twice as good. good. Today we're visiting New York, and one of the most amazing sights that we'll see today is the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty is just one of the amazing sights we'll see today. One place you could definitely spend an entire day is the American Museum of Natural History. There, we'll have an opportunity to travel to the stars in the Coleman Hall of the Universe and then back in time with a tour of the Hall of Ceriskian Dinosaurs. We'll take to the stage on Broadway to meet Abby Mueller, the star of the smash Broadway show, Beautiful, the Carol King Musical. And since no trip to New York would be complete without a visit to Central Park, we'll take a walking tour with Dr. Robert DeCandido, better known as Birding Bob, and noted New York City bird and nature photographer, Deborah Allen, to learn why the park is such a hospitable habitat for the city's avian inhabitants. New York City is located where the Hudson River meets the Atlantic Ocean at the mouth of one of the world's largest natural harbors. The city covers just under 303 square miles, and it is made up of five boroughs, Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx, and Staten Island. Home to more than eight and a half million people, New York is the most populous city in the United States. New York City is affectionately known as the Big Apple, but that nickname has nothing to do with fruit. Its origin can be traced back to the 1920s. A sports reporter named John Fitzgerald, whose beat was the racetrack, heard stable hands refer to the city as the Big Apple because the racetracks there were considered the big time. Fitzgerald liked the phrase and started using Big Apple in his newspaper columns. But before New York City was nicknamed the Big Apple, it was known briefly as New Orange. When England's King Charles II granted the lands to his brother, the Duke of York, the city was named New York. But in 1673, the Dutch were in control of the area and renamed it New Orange, in honor of William III of Orange. In the end, the English regained control and the name New York stuck. Today, New York City is a thriving hub of the arts, entertainment, commerce, diplomacy, and history. Broadway, Times Square, and Lincoln Center, the United Nations and South Street Seaport, the Empire State and Chrysler buildings, and museums like the Metropolitan <gasps> Museum of Art, the Guggenheim, and the Museum of Modern Art make it one of the most visited cities in the world. But of all the things New York is known for, the thing it may be the most famous for is its food. From Chinatown, Little Italy, Little India, and Katz's Deli on the Lower East Side up to Harlem where soul food rules. Visitors to New York can sample authentic flavors from across the country and around the globe. Our New York home for today's cooking segments will be the world famous and iconic Tavern on the Green. It's located in Central Park, and we will be cooking with executive chef Bill Peet. Few restaurants in America can match the amazing history of Tavern on the Green. In the 1880s, the site on which the restaurant now sits was then used by sheep grazing in Central Park. Today, Tavern on the Green focuses on local and artisanal food, and Chef Pete will be taking us through a few of his current favorites. We're going to start with the asparagus. These are jumbo asparagus. We're going just to season it a little bit. We're going to take the pancetta, and now we're going to bake this off in the oven until it's nice and crispy. This was about 10 minutes, and see how nice and crispy it is? We're going to poach off an egg. We're going to add a little vinegar. So we have white wine vinegar and olive oil. We have a little Dijon mustard and a little whole grain mustard. Why don't you just whisk that up a little bit? I'm gonna crack the egg and just pop it right in the water. 
what we're gonna do is we're gonna put these on top. So this is the poached egg, the poached grilled asparagus, the pancetta that we baked off. Here's the vinaigrette. You wanna just garnish that with a little bit of parsley. This is grilled jumbo asparagus, and we serve it with the baked pancetta and a whole grain mustard vinaigrette and a poached egg. Coleman Halls of the Universe here at the American Museum of Natural History presents the discoveries of modern astrophysics. Divided into four zones, the hall covers the formation, evolution, and properties of the stars, planets, galaxies, and the universe. And at the heart of this space is an 87-foot diameter sphere that appears to float inside of a glass cube. Its upper half constitutes the Hayden Planetarium, a space theater which displays a hyper-realistic view of the planets, star clusters, nebulae, and galaxies. Well, you can explore the stars in the universe from here. Where we are standing is just the beginning of the American Museum of Natural History. Founded in 1869, the American Museum of Natural History is regarded as one of the world's preeminent scientific and cultural museums. The museum is also home to the official New York State Memorial to the state's 33rd governor and America's 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, who is one of the museum's earliest champions. The museum's dinosaur halls are one of its premier attractions. We're here in the Hall of Sarisky and Dinosaurs with museum tour guide Vicki Costa. When did dinosaurs last roam the Earth? Well, we're thinking about 66 million years ago for the large non-avian. Now, what do I mean by large non-avian, right? We still have dinosaurs. We still have dinosaurs. We call them birds. So technically, we still have dinosaurs, but the large ones that we're focusing on in here about 66 million years ago. What's your favorite dinosaur here? T-Rex is a big draw here in this museum, and everybody comes in to see T-Rex. And this museum has a special place in their heart. First of all, this museum found the first T-Rex. This museum named T-Rex, Tyrant Lizard King led to the dinosaur's distinction? Well, that was complicated. There were a lot of things going on at the time. In India, there was a lot of volcanoes that were going off, and it was poisoning the air. There was plate tectonics. Plates were moving around. Waters were rising and falling. Some were, plates were slamming into one another, causing mountain building, changing the climate. But the one-two punch it was a meteorite that came in, the size of the island of Manhattan, slams into the Yucatan Peninsula, tosses up ejecta, and then the food chain started to go. The plants, the plant eaters, the meat eaters, so what could survive? Anything that was small, small mammals and small dinosaurs. If you take T-Rex, you take Arche Archaeopteryx, Deinonychus, your Thanksgiving Day turkey, you take the pigeon in the park, put them all on a shelf. They share over 80 anatomical features. Can you tell us about the process of how the archaeologists find the bones and eventually bring them here? To find a dinosaur, why is it so rare? Because it had to die a certain way. Because if something dies and it's on top of the ground, all of this, the bacteria will get in, the animals will take it apart. So to find these animals, if they die, they have to be quickly covered with dirt, with ash, so they decay very, very slowly. And as they start to decay, molecule, atom at a time, it is filled in with the minerals in the overlying soil. And so that's why it takes thousands and thousands and millions of years. And what you really have is a mineralized reproduction of the actual bone. We're gonna make one of our signature dishes. It's called a chopped vegetable salad. These are all vegetables. There's no 
lettuce at all. Those are roasted butternut squash. These are radish, red radish. Is this jicama? That is jicama, you're right. These are fingerling potatoes. So you had pencil asparagus. This is shredded carrots. And they're raw? They are raw. This is our vinaigrette. You wanna mix that up for me? A little bit of salt, a little bit of white pepper again, and we'll just put it in there. Okay, put a little lemon zest. Oh, this adds a little brightness too. We're gonna add a little avocado in here also. So you can mix that in also. Okay, so what you want now is to spoon this right into the center. Oh, well, we're gonna finish it with a little fried capers. It's the only item in here that's fried and a little bit of parsley. So that's the dish. That's how easy it was. New York City's theater district is where you'll find an amazing array of Broadway shows. At the heart of the theater district is Times Square. A current must-see for visitors to Broadway is Beautiful, which tells the story of the early life and career of Carole King. In Beautiful's title role, the part of Carole King is played today by Abby Mueller. It's so amazing that you're able to work here. Does it still hit you every time you walk in how special it is? Absolutely. Yep, I still feel like I'm kind of like pinching myself every night when I get to come in. You know, to see your picture out front, it's kind of surreal, but really, really cool, and I feel, I feel grateful every single time. Is it intimidating to play the role of someone so musically accomplished as Carol King? <sighs> A little bit, right? Yeah, I think um, intimidating but and challenging, but also um, so rewarding and so uh, I, I feel a, a real sense of privilege and responsibility to her because she is such an icon. What advice has she given you? She said um, to always remember the importance of the ensemble. You know, the whole band is working together. Like, it's that sense of ensemble and how important it is to acknowledge the band members. So I really try to always remember that in, in the scenes that we're playing. Can you tell us a little bit about your pathway up to Broadway? I uh, grew up in Chicago. I've got uh, three siblings. I got a twin brother brother and a sister and a younger brother. Aww. Yeah, I'm a twin too. Yeah, and I went to high school and, and it was a really good um, theater program in my high school and started doing plays and um, then I started doing um, summer stock theater when I was in college. I still wasn't sure what I was doing in college if I wanted to be a professional actor, but I started working and that really, that experience really um, was valuable to me and gave me some direction and then I started working professionally in Chicago right out of school. And then I decided to move to New York and was fortunate enough to start working here and then here I am. What do you think makes Beautiful different from a lot of other Broadway plays? I think what makes it um, so awesome is that it has kind of something for everybody. There's this story and people come in knowing the songs and they know they're gonna love the songs. I think people can see themselves in Carol or Jerry or Barry and Cynthia. What's a typical day like for a Broadway actor? Say like on a Saturday we have two shows going into two more shows on Sunday. So I usually try to sleep in and we don't get home until about 11.30, midnight, oh. and then I get up and try to do some warm-ups, and then I hop on the train and I come here, and then we're sort of like, go, go, go. What advice do you have for kids who are aspiring to be on Broadway? It sounds kind of cheesy, but it really is just follow your heart and make sure you get the training that you might need, but also remember to um, get an education and become a well-rounded person because as an actor, your job is to portray people, right? So the more life experience you have, the more well-rounded and, and greater your scope and compassion is, the more tools you have to at your disposal to hopefully create that in front of an audience. We're gonna make uh, one of our main courses for dinner, and we call it a caramelized diver sea scallops. We're going to season these I also use white pepper in the kitchen. We're gonna add a little vegetable oil. The pan is on, it's nice and hot. How thick do you want the scallops to be? These are U10 dry sea scallops. That means it's under 10 per pound. That's how big they are. So now we're gonna turn it. What I'm going to do is add a little butter, uh, about a half a teaspoon. Let's put this in first. Let's put so we don't lose this. And this is garlic 
So you're just smashing the garlic I with your hands. the garlic, that's it. Because we're gonna baste some of this liquid. So we have the flavor of the thyme and the garlic in the butter. We're going to take these out, but we're going to heat up our asparagus. So this, we don't want to brown the butter, and we don't have to do all of this asparagus. So. What is the difference between green and white asparagus? White asparagus is almost the same, but it's grown underground. So that's all we want to do. We just want to heat it up. This is the arugula pesto. We just took arugula and a little extra virgin olive oil and put it in a blender. Just put a little bit of this as we're going just to put these scallops around. These are pea shoots. With this, we're going to add a little bit of lemon juice. This is like a vinaigrette. Does a that balance bit. out the flavor? Yeah, a little bit of salt. You should always season your salad. We're just gonna mix this a little bit and we're just gonna put that right on top. So that's our dish. New York City is known for its skyscrapers, but the city planners knew that people who live here needed access to the natural world. New York City has more than 1,700 parks, playgrounds, and recreation facilities across the five boroughs. The New York Botanical Gardens in the Bronx encompasses 250 acres alone. But the most famous urban oasis in New York by far is Manhattan Central Park. The park was established in 1857 on 778 acres of city-owned property. In 1858, architect Frederick Law Olmsted and landscape architect Calvert Vox won a design competition to improve and expand the park. Construction began in the first public area of the park, opened in the winter of 1858. Building continued through the year 1873, when the park reached its current size of 843 acres. Central Park today plays host to the Central Park Zoo, the Great Lawn, the Belvedere Castle, and the Delacorte Theater, where every summer, Shakespeare in the Park brings the plays of William Shakespeare to life. We're meeting with Dr. Robert DeCandido, or Birding Bob, and nature photographer, Deb Allen, for a birding tour of Central Park. Can you tell us what kind of birds you can see in Central Park? This is May, and the peak migration season for the entire year is going on right now. 225, 250 different types of species, different kinds of birds here. How do you find the birds? I use a sound machine, and the birds come looking for me. What's the best kind of bird to photograph? Oh, well, I like the little colorful ones. What is the most unusual bird in the park? Right now, I think the peregrine falcons nesting at the southwest corner of the park. Peregrines, maybe 25, 30 years ago, were not in New York City. Now, they may be our most common nesting raptor in Manhattan. So should we look around and maybe play some sounds and see if we can bring in a bird? We'll do some bird fishing? Of course. Oh, yes. Okay, so we're gonna play a raucous call. We're gonna play a loud red-eyed vireo. This red-eyed vireo is upset. And I'm gonna play it up here. Oh, he's found an owl or a cat and he's letting all the other birds in the neighborhood know that there's a problem around. So we'll switch this for a second to a different call. We call this a yellow warbler alarm call. Birds respond to the world very much by sound. So they're hearing a sound that they don't recognize and they're curious like people. This is a call saying, this is my territory. Oh, look at that. Oh, we got all the grackles we could ever possibly want. Are grackles a very common bird? In this park, yes. In other places, no. But in cities, they often do very well. What happens to the birds during the winter? They go where the food is. So if there's no food here, they head south. He's on the ground, not because he's looking for fish or a home. He's looking for a certain type of food, an invertebrate, something without a backbone, like an insect or earthworms. Yeah, and they can go out there every day and find all this stuff to eat. And if we had to do that, if we had to come into the park and find things to eat to feed ourselves for the day, we'd have a really hard time, but they can do it. Today we're gonna to do a chocolate peanut butter lava cake. Lava meaning that it's all molten when you cut into it. I took whole butter, 
and the 64% chocolate, and I added it to a hot water bath. We have egg yolks and whole eggs. This is sugar, so we're gonna add this right to the eggs. I wanna melt all the sugar. Okay, so we're gonna add the chocolate. We're gonna add the flour to it. You wanna just pour that flour in? It'll bind it together. Now these are four ounce cups, and I actually took some of the uh, vegetable shortening spray and sprayed them, so these are all prepared. So this peanut butter is room temperature. Oh, so you're just gonna put one dollop in the center of each. Yes. Next step is to finish the rest of this chocolate. They will rise a little bit. The outside will be nice and cooked and the inside will be still molten. I'm gonna take this and bake this off for 10 minutes now. So here, that's what they look like when they come out. We're going to invert one. So a little bit of powdered sugar on top and then we'll put a little vanilla ice cream right on top, like a little sauce, how about that? This is the chocolate peanut butter lava cake. The Statue of Liberty was commissioned as a gift from the people of France to the people of the United States and serves as an enduring symbol of freedom worldwide. French artist Frederick Auguste Bartholdi designed Lady Liberty in the neoclassic style. Construction on her began in the year 1875. Eleven years later, it was dedicated in October of 1886. The statue was created in France and shipped in pieces to the United States, where it was assembled on what was then known as Bedloe's Island. Of course, now it is called Ellis Island. The statue stands 305 feet from the ground. Her sandals are 25 feet long and at her feet lay chains that represent the broken shackles of oppression and tyranny. On her head, she wears a crown that has seven points, representing the world's seven continents. Each point is nine feet long and weighs 150 pounds. Imagine wearing that on your head. In her left hand, she holds a tablet that is almost 24 feet tall and 14 feet wide. It is inscribed with the date July 4th, 1776, commemorating our Declaration of Independence. The statue's total weight is 450,000 pounds. 250,000 pounds of that weight is from steel. 179,000 pounds is from copper. Interesting science fact. It's the natural weathering of the copper that gives the statue its distinctive light green color, or patina. If you've ever seen an old copper penny, you might have noticed the same light green color. The New Colossus is the poem inscribed at the foot of the statue. It contains the well-known line, Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Ellis Island was the gateway for over 12 million immigrants to the United States as the nation's busiest immigration inspection station for over 60 years from 1892 until 1954. The island was expanded using reclaimed land between 1892 and 1934. Ellis Island was incorporated into the Statue of Liberty National Monument in 1965 and has hosted a Museum of Immigration since 1990. It's estimated that nearly half of U.S. population can trace his or her family history to at least one person who entered the country through the Port of New York at Ellis Island. thank everyone who made our trip to New York City so memorable. We appreciate Chef Pete at Tavern on the Green for sharing some truly inspiring recipes with us today. And we are so very thankful to Abby Wheeler for giving us an inside view of Broadway and showing us just how beautiful New York can be. We're also grateful to Birding Bob and Deb Allen who showed us the side of Central Park few visitors see. And Vicki Costa, tour guide at the American Museum of Natural History, who brought the ancient world of dinosaurs to life. New York is a city with an amazing breadth of cultural activities and a world-class culinary scene. And that combination is not just good, it's twice as good!
Twice as Good with Hadley and Delaney is brought to you by Mila. Emma Besser, forever better. Mila. And by Cuties. Cute, you can eat. Cuties. Kitchen Works. Wherever we go, that's where the party's at. Kitchen Works. <laughs>